Hello and welcome to the item interactions. As all of you are aware, the item interactions is in-depth conversation on various topics. And India has focused very majorly on economic affairs issues in starting the last week of January. Of course, we had uh, in the run-up to the budget, we had this Hindenburg report coming and all kinds of mayhem happening in the stock market with the Adani stocks crashing. And generally, there were a lot of discussions on the health of the Indian economy from various dimensions, not only in larger macroeconomic terms, but also in terms of its stock market and things like that. In such a context, there was a journalist in India, a senior economic affairs journalist who has pioneered very serious in-depth economic affairs journalism in this country for nearly four and a half decades. Paranjoy Guha Thakurta. Paranjoy, welcome to the item interactions. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Venkatesh. You <laughs> flattered me by those fulsome remarks yeah. you've made about me. I don't deserve any well, of well, compliments. <laughs> well, I've seen you for such a long time. I have been interacting with you for nearly three decades myself. So. And I've been working as a journalist for 45 years. I'm 67 years old. I entered the profession when I was 22. Yeah, so the point is, the man who should have been talking so much in a context like this and the Hindenburg report, you are very prominently mentioned in the report, of course, along with one of your uh, colleagues and associates. Uh, and of course, uh, the lot of the report, it's very clear, though they have not quoted you, it's very clear that it emanates from your work. The references are there. Yeah, but you should have been talking a lot, but you are not in a position to talk. I, I, I would like to know what exactly has happened. I am actually the only journalist who has been mentioned by name in the Hindenburg report, which runs into 32,000 words. Uh, several reports prepared by other journalists, including those I've worked with, they find mention, the references are there, media organizations are there. I'm the only citizen of this country against whom lawyers representing corporate entities that are headed by Shri Gautam Adani have instituted no less than six defamation cases. Two of these cases pertain to an article that was written and published in Newsclick. Okay. It was written by Abhir Das Gupta and myself. It talked about how a particular judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Arun Kumar Mishra, had given a series of judgments, all of which favored the Adani group. What was taken up, I mean, this article is available right. for people right. uh, to read. Yeah. It's not been taken down from yeah, the website. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, somebody sent me that article again, repeated that article to me today. Okay, <laughs> so it was like yeah. the headline. Yeah. The headline they've taken objection to because the headline says something to the effect that Justice Arun Kumar Mishra's parting within inverted commas gift of 8,000 crore rupees to Adani. Now that use of that word, even if it is within inverted commas, uh, has been taken objection to. I mean, I mean, they say that we've sought to lower the esteem of the judiciary in the eyes of the public. Right. So, uh, in September 2020, a gag order was issued against me, the co-author of that article, Abhir Das Gupta, and the portal, NewsClick, that published it. Right. It was, that was a third of a series of three articles. Uh, after these two, uh, another case was instituted in a district called Bara in Rajasthan. It, it's where the Adani uh, group has a power plant and uh, Prabir Puraka is the a shareholder of Newsclip, News uh, who had absolutely nothing to do with that article. Uh, Mr. D. Raghunandan and yours truly and before us, Abhir Das Gupta, we had to travel there. Uh, we had to travel to Kota, which is kind of halfway between Delhi and Mumbai, and from there travel another 100, 100 plus kilometers to appear before the Grameen Nala, mm. the village court, to get bail bond and uh, present sureties, individuals mm. who would be act on our behalf. So, in, since September 2020, I have been circumspect in saying anything about yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm told the order said that you should not harm the interests of the Adani group by talking or, uh, or speaking about 
People are welcome to interpret the order of the honorable magistrates and judges in the way they like. The way I interpret it, and this is why I'm speaking with you and I've spoken with others as well, I'll stick to facts. Okay. If you ask for my opinion, I'll say I have no opinion. If you ask me, is it good that the shares of the Adani group collapsed? Hmm. I said I have no comment on yeah, that. Absolutely. But that the shares have collapsed, on that there's no doubt. Yeah. It's, it's, hmm. it's, it's information in the public domain. Right. So you might genuinely ask me, why did I decide to speak at this juncture? One, of course, was that my, I was the only journalist named in the Hindenburg Report, and there was a reference to another case. And that pertained to a case that was led to my resignation from the post of the Economic and Political Weekly in July 2017. Mm. And if you like, uh, for the benefit of your viewers, I can summarize the yeah, main yeah, point. Yeah. Essentially, that was a long article. Besides me, there were three other young, my fellow employees at that time. Uh, we wrote about how the rules pertaining to power projects in special economic zones had been changed over the years. The last one had been changed after our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi came to power. And the, the change in these rules benefited one corporate entity the most, and that was Adani Par. The second part of that article pointed out that the government of India, the Ministry of Finance, the Department of Commerce, the Ministry of Finance was then headed by Sri Arun Jaitley, the Department of Commerce was headed by uh, Mrs. Nirmala Sitharaman, our finance minister at present. They were processing an application for refund of customs duties to the tune of more than 500 crore rupees. Mm. So the question I raised in that article, me and my fellow authors, how can you process an application for refund of customs duties without first checking whether the duty had not been paid? Yeah. Subsequently, that, never, that money never went to the Adani group because my sources were correct. I had the documentation to prove it. So though the, pro the processing of that refund application were taking place, clearly, since the duty hadn't been paid, yeah. you're not eligible you for the point. refund. Yeah. You pay more money to the income tax department then and you ask for a refund, they'll give it to you. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was the situation. Yeah, but then, yeah, what happened with the with, with the what, what happened with the organization? I mean, okay, uh, the Economic and Political Weekly and uh, those who own the Economic and Political Weekly, the Samiksha Trust, they took great objection to my decision to engage the services of a lawyer pro bono uh, to reply to that legal hmm. notice that had been served on. Me, my co-authors, uh, me as the editor, the writer, the co-author, the publisher, mm. the printer. Yeah. The publisher in this case was a Samiksha Trust. Mm. So what they took an objection to was that I had not taken the prior permission and approval of the Board of Trustees. Mm. Mm. So I was summoned to Delhi. I was told that uh, what you've done is an act of grave impropriety. I argued that this was a technical error for which I am apologetic, I'll apologize, but I did not consider it to be hmm. an act, of, which was an act of grave impropriety. Right. The trustees, the honorable trustees of the Samiksha Trust thought otherwise. They uh, told me that I couldn't write anymore under my byline in that publication because my predecessors had not. I was told they were appointing a co-editor I was told that I had destroyed the ethos of an organization which is like an institution almost as old as this country. Yeah. And finally, I was told that I could not leave that room until that article was pulled down from the website. Right. So that didn't take very long. Yeah. I requested one of my former colleagues, please take it down. And then they saw that it had been taken down, error 404 or something. Yeah. Yeah. So then I asked for a piece of paper and I wrote out my resignation. What I could not have imagined was the number of people who came out in my support. Subsequently, yeah. literally hundreds of people, yeah. scholars, activists, etc., including two Nobel laureates, yeah. Professor Amartya Sen, Angus Deaton, somebody I hold in very high esteem, the, the scholar, American scholar, Professor Noam Chomsky. Yeah. So that took some time, that period of turmoil took some time to sort of die down. But the wire, which had republished this article, 
got sued mm. together with us. And then the case went on. It was at that time before a magistrate in Bhuj, the capital of Kutch district in Gujarat. The magistrate gave an order, and you can read the order if you go to the article uh, which has been published by The Wire. He asked for the deletion of a word and a sentence. Wire complied with the decision of the order, and the article is there for anybody and everybody to read. It has a headline, how the Modi government gave away 500 crore bonanza to Adani, something along those lines. Right. All right, the story doesn't end here. I'll quickly mm. con conclude the story. In May 2019, before the Lok Sabha election results were announced, the elections were over for reasons that I've never been able to figure out why. Mr. Adani's lawyers withdrew that defamation cases against the wire, the entity that runs the wire, mm. against three of my co-authors, mm. everybody except me. Okay. So I appeared in court. Then Corona happened. Mm. And then in January 2021, the second wave was yet to begin. Right. I was told by a correspondent of the Press Trust of India, are you aware that there is a non-bailable warrant of arrest against you? Mm. So I said, hello, I'm hearing this for the first time. Mm. It had evidently reached the PTI correspondent before it reached my lawyer. Right. And finally, he WhatsApp the number to me yeah. and my lawyer said, you know, I'll fight you, mm. don't stay at home. Mm. My wife was very upset, uh, my sister, everybody was very upset. The short point is after a gap of about 10 days, my lawyer, my advocate, Anand Yagnik, succeeded in uh, getting a stay on the execution of the warrant from the High Court of Gujarat in Ahmedabad. Okay. His arguments was this warrant was bad in law hmm. because the allegation against me was that I did not appear in court. Right. So he said for non-appearance in court, hmm. you can issue a bailable warrant, not a non-bailable warrant. Hmm. He said the courts have been closed for a long time because of COVID. So eventually, I did appear in court. Okay. I appeared before the Honorable Magistrate, the first class judicial magistrate at Mundra in Gujarat on two occasions, once in February 2021 and again in March. Hmm. And uh, I, his name is uh, Shri Pradeep Soni, Pradeep B. Soni. And I said that, look, I am willing to contest the allegations against me. But again, for reasons I've not been able to fathom, from March 2021, since I appeared there, mm. it's almost two years. Yeah. There's been no. The, the, the case been has not progressed. progressed. Uh, no. So the trial hasn't even begun. And uh, you have been single, singled out for this kind of uh, treatment also, in the sense you know that uh, all others who were uh, who were part of the so-called accused, they the case. No, no, I was. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would there, <laughs> and, and I appeared twice. Every time, yes. Aropi Hazir hai. I said, Haan, Aropi Hazir hai. Yeah. So I had to sign on, on a piece of paper yeah. that I, I was present, yes, before right. the court. Right. So now, of course, you have made it very clear that you know you will not make any commentary on the developments. You cannot make a commentary even if you wanted to. I mean, I, I know otherwise, uh, uh, par Paranjoy is not short of words for uh, <laughs> on, on any on, on any economic affairs matter. I know that. So and also something which is uh, something which we have uh, very closely pursued uh, uh, the Adani, uh, the, the rise of the Adani Empire, uh, the growth of it, uh, the empire, the way it has been supplemented and supported by the powers that be. These are things which you have very closely followed for nearly a decade. I mean, uh, uh, I, no, I, not really a decade. I remember your first article was sometime in 2015. That's correct. Yeah. So not yet a decade. Yeah. But, but that my first article was essentially a compilation of articles, uh, a co compilation of existing reports which was published by the citizen. Right. Uh, Seema Mustafa had asked me to write. Yeah, yeah. My first major uh, exclusive story appeared soon after I joined the Economic and Political Weekly in April of 2016. And thereafter I wrote several articles all the way to the article that was published in June 2017 that led to my resignation, yes. Yeah. Uh, my articles essentially were based on leaked information from government sources. How the Directorate of Revenue Intelligence, the, the intelligence wing of the Customs and Revenue Department in the Ministry of Finance, they had uh, served show cause notices, how they put an alert 
to 50 customs establishments to be careful. There were 40 companies under the scanner, including several companies belonging to the Adani group. And the allegation by the DRI was these companies were misdeclaring the value of the coal that they were importing, misdeclaring the value of uh, uh, the, Im the machinery that, were, that was being imported for uh, in, uh, generation of power. And there were further allegations that this money, the proceeds of the alleged over invoicing, were being round tripped through tax havens. So these were the allegations. And uh, this particular case, as I told you, 40 companies, including public sector companies, right. including com several private sector companies, electricity board and, and, and discoms, as they call them, yeah. dis distribution companies, it is still not resolved. Yeah. Uh, it went all the way through to the SESTAT, that's the Customs Excise Sales Tax Appellate Tribunal, and it's currently pending before the Supreme Court of India. The DRI appealed against the order of the SESTAT, and it's but this is the, one aspect of what is before the Supreme Court now. That's right. The Supreme Court has also taken cognizance of the Hindenburg Report, the stock market. And it has asked a very important question. What were the regulatory authorities like SEBI doing? Uh, perhaps you may not be want to comment on this, but the point is, you know, it's a very valid thing. Okay. <laughs> you know, Venkatesh, it is a very valid point, you know. Uh, the, I mean, the facts are as follows. The Securities and Exchange Board of India is supposed to be the regulator of our capital markets and our financial markets. The first series of articles that appeared alleging that there were certain foreign portfolio investors based in tax havens like Mauritius, Cyprus, British Virgin Islands, etc., etc., they were invested heavily in stocks right. belonging to the Adani Group. Now, if one particular investor has, say, 95% or 98% of all its investments uh, in a particular group. The question that would arise is, if SEBI registers this firm, has it violated the SEBI's own rules or not? So these were raised uh, in CNBC, the television channel. Uh, it was subsequently also raised by the Economic Times. And then Ravi Nair, uh, wrote a series of articles for this website called adaniwatch.org. Mm -hmm. In fact, several of the Hindenburg uh, allegations have drawn heavily From on, the... on, on some of these reports that appeared, and this appeared quite some time back. Yeah. It appeared about uh, uh, more than a year ago. Yeah. And, and it is a fact that members of parliament, including Mahua Moitra of the Trinamool Congress, and she knows what she's talking about. She's, in, she's been an investment banker. She's written to SEBI. She wrote, please do something about it. Please in, uh, inquire into this, uh, whether these allegations are correct or not. And in parliament and outside parliament, uh, Mahama Moitra, among others, have said, raise this question. Yeah. What are you doing? What have you been doing for the last but it's the You're same question now that's being rephrased by the Supreme Court in a different matter. Let us see how it goes. Yeah, that, I, I suppose the Supreme Court is concerned, as many others are, because there's been a sharp drop in investor value. Yeah. Large numbers of individuals, their investments have shrunk dramatically in value uh, from uh, the 24th of January when the Hindenburg report came yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah, the other, another aspect which of course, you know, uh, which again, uh, one of Ravi Nair's reports had said uh, uh, that uh, the, the, the chairman of the Adani group had had a one-to-one -one meeting with the, the topmost authorities at the SEBI, uh, which of course has also not been denied. Like it is. Yeah. It appeared in the Hindu business line for the first time. Yeah. A and and uh, Ravi Nair wrote to the SEBI yeah. uh, head. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Madhavi Puri Butch asking her yeah. whether it is correct that she met. Uh, so, so the question that would arise is that if there's a corporate entity that is at that particular point of time about to embark on what is was claimed as India's largest follow on public offer of shares about 20,000 crore. Uh, is this the thing? That, that's the question we ask. Is this common practice that the person concerned meets the SEBI head and other officials. So this is the question that we asked her 
uh, but we never got a response to it. Okay. You know, and and we also asked her, uh, not we, I beg your pardon, it's Ravi Nair. Though yeah. I, I've worked with him very closely, yeah. and we have together written several articles, including about the airports. Yeah. The question that was asked of uh, the SEBI head was uh, whether she was directly in charge of these investigations in her earlier avatar when she was a whole time member of the Securities and Exchange Board of okay. India. So I think everybody's wait, waiting and let us see uh, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, what it has in mind where when it's asked SEBI to present before it a sort of uh, a kind of a outline of how investor interests are to be protected. Right. And of course, you know, you, you have made it very clear that you will not uh, speculate on the future of the Adani group or its prospects and stuff. But the fact remains that somebody who was uh, touted as the, uh, the, the third largest or the second largest uh, rich man in the world, he has now fallen down and he's not in the first 20, that's what I get to hear. Uh, but anyway, the, 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 the collapse of the, the, the overall financial structure of the organization is very, very clear. Uh, but uh, uh, as an observer, I mean, I'm not talking about uh, uh, Adani or I'm not talking, when this kind of a collapse happens to any company, what is the general scenario that, uh, that, that such companies face? I mean, I'm not talking specifically about mm -hmm. Adani, I'm, I'm talking theor no, theoretically. Uh, first, let me give you a specific answer, then a general answer. Yeah. For about 20 years, 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, very few people had heard of Mr. Gautam Adani. You know, that he was a college dropout, that he had uh, started by trading in diamonds and plastic waste and then worked with the family uh, concern making plastic products. Very few people had heard of him. When he first acquired uh, some land at Mundra in Gujarat, there was a Congress government in power. And as you know, Mr. Adani in his various interviews have said that, you know, the policies of the Rajiv Gandhi government, the Narasimha Rao government, all helped his rise. But the fact is that after Mr. Narendra Modi became the chief minister of Gujarat in 2001, uh, the, Mr. Adani's business conglomerate started expanding. In fact, it's common knowledge that in 2002, after the Hindu Muslim riots in Gujarat, there were several business persons who came together uh, to counter other business persons like Rahul Bajaj, who was then, I think, a part of the CII, the Confederation of Indian Industry, who expressed his unhappiness with what had happened in Gujarat and said, this is not good for business. But there were several other businessmen, including Mr. Adani, who set up a, another organization. And many believe that was the genesis of the series of meetings that were called Vibrant Gujarat, the summits that were held subsequently. But I would say Mr. Adani's rise was absolutely spectacular after Mr. Modi Came became the Prime Minister of India in 2014. And this is well documented, everybody knows. The sheer pace at which his corporate empire expanded, the number of areas it's into, and you know, that's a very long list. Yeah. I, I, I can... Yeah, it's mind boggling. I, 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 I can tell you about that list, yeah. but to first answer your question, the rise was spectacular, but the fall was even more spectacular. Few could have imagined that here was a firm based in New York, they call themselves activist short sellers, yeah would have the kind of impact it had, yeah. you know, uh, and there have been allegations, counter allegations, everything has been in the public domain. But honestly, I can speak for myself. I could never have imagined what happened happened. On the day before the presentation of the budget on the 1st of February, uh, when it was announced that the 20,000 crore follow-on public offering had been fully oversubscribed after there was a very, very lukewarm response in the previous days. Yeah. Many of us thought, including me, that, you know, he, the worst is over, uh, he's sort of ridden the storm. And it gave us a big surprise to all of us that on the night of the presentation, after the presentation of the budget, that's the 1st of February, 
quite late at night, after 10.30 at night, there was a formal announcement that the offer had been withdrawn mm -hmm. and all those who had invested their monies, yeah. they would be repaid. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, the following morning, very early in the morning, uh, a video was put out featuring Mr. Uh, Adani yeah. and he said that... Significantly uh, taking off, he, he was not in his usual uh, suited uh, suit and uh, uh, formal suit, but he was wearing an Indian dress, you know, to emphasize the, 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 the nationalist angle. No, no, oh, no oh, I, I do not know about that. Yeah. What I can say is when the CFO, the chief financial officer of the group, uh, addressed the media, uh, behind you was a national flag. The flag of India seemed to be more prominent uh, than the Adani Group's logo. And this is not the first time that the interests of one corporate conglomerate has been sought to be conflated with the interests of the country. Mm. And what actually struck a lot of people was the comparison that was drawn to the Jallianwala Bag massacre, yeah. where the British used Indian soldiers to fire on other Indians. And uh, an analogy was drawn. Yeah. Uh, so that took a lot of people by surprise. And this is not the first time, but it's like, if you criticize Mr. Adani, then you're an anti-national thing. I mean, this is the kind of discourse. Mm. I personally don't think so. And I think there are several people, including the spokesperson of the Bharati Janata Party, investment banker P.N. Vijay, who's used a rather strong word to uh, those who are sort of equating Mr. Adani's interests with that of the nation, and uh, um, it's unparliamentary, but he said this is bullshit. I didn't say it, he said he it. Said I saw it on Rajdeep Sardesai's program right. uh, a, a few days before the budget. Right, right. So uh, um, that's, that's really um, what I want to say. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I, I think, you know... We no, no, one second, I didn't answer one question of yours. <laughs> what happened to everybody? Yes, of course, there are large numbers of ordinary investors and if the value of their investments collapse, then you can't expect them to be happy. Yeah. So clearly uh, the impact is not just confined to a few people. Yeah. because. Uh, and it, of course it, the larger it, question with the Supreme Court's observation and all that, I think the larger question is how far the the larger judiciary of this country would intervene to protect the interests of these common people. I think that's a very important question. We'll have to wait and watch and yeah. see what the Supreme Court does. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope that uh, the time comes for us to talk at greater length and more openly on this very specific issue. But as I said in the very beginning of this interview, uh, Paranjoy Guha Takurta's uh, work, if you, if you look at the, the, the quantum of work that he has done, the volume of work, the, the, the multifaceted dimensions of the work that he has done, uh, Gautam Adani and his group will form hardly 5% of that work. He has done a lot of work on I the I haven't land. done that calculation <laughs> meditation. No, no, I, I, I'm also making a, uh, a kind of, you know, a kind of uh, assessment, but then I, maybe I want to... I've written on several uh, corporate groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have, what is not only on corporate rules, but you have also looked at on the economy, economy yeah. larger economy. We will continue the conversation and look forward to having you more often in the in the in the item interactions. Thank you very much for giving us the time. My pleasure.